Hey, you cutie pies. Welcome back to another episode of Still Positive. I feel like garbage today. How about you? I have a stuffy nose that may or may not be because of allergies, but may just be because no one's wearing masks anymore. So I blame not wearing masks. Honestly, I think that everyone needs to wear masks so we don't spread germs ever. Coronavirus, non-coronavirus, cold. I don't want it. I don't want any of it. Over it. I have enough shit to deal with. Anyway, I hope that you don't. I hope that you're feeling well, as well as you can. And thanks for jumping in to this episode uh, with Constanza. I have a really fun time trying to understand how you pronounce her name, but I got it right. So, she is the CEO and founder of Hearts Need Art, an organization of artists or musicians who go into hospital settings or virtually and give some art and music and writing and storytelling to people who are in isolation from being chronically ill or disabled. I wish I would have known about this when I was in the hospital because it's exactly what I want. <laughs> like I just want to doodle with someone to motivate me too. Like while, while I'm laying in bed, I don't want to do it myself, you know. Sometimes I would try, but if someone's there doing it with me, I'm like, damn, that's good. I want to do that too. So this is an amazing organization, and I was so happy that Constanza reached out to me and wanted to talk a little bit more about Heart Seed Art. Enjoy. Let's be real. People love to gloss over chronic conditions or disabilities with a fleeting comment like, just be positive or a fleeting insult like kale will cure you this is a podcast for when you face a different reality knowing that positivity isn't a magic wand that's going to cure everything but a flashlight in the dark that we may or may not have batteries to living with a chronic illness or disability makes you feel different and your difference could be noticeable to others or not but either can sometimes make you feel invisible I'm here to tell you that your experience is valid and shared by others in the dark. Positivity is not the missing puzzle piece that's going to solve your life's puzzle, but it can be a beautiful tool that can help you grow, and sharing those experiences can make us grow together. Very good. What is that um, background that you have? Well, I have... um... A Sicilian father and an Irish Scottish mother and an Austrian husband. So oh. I have, a, I have, a, I have a Italian first name, an Irish middle name, and a German last name. Nice. <laughs> when I traveled, I got to go to Europe a couple of years ago, and the woman checking me in was opening. She was this big German lady, and she was checking me in, and she would open open my passport, and she was like. Oh, you Americans with your crazy names. You have a German first name and an English middle name. She just was like appalled by the <laughs> languages. But like, yeah. there's right. a lot of prejudice that happens in Europe. Oh, yeah, definitely. Purebred or nothing at all. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Did you, were you always an artist? Like, how did you get into art? Were you always creative? Ooh, um, well, I always did music. Um, I came from a very musical family. My mom was a singer and played piano and my grandmother was a musician. And um, I, do we, I we, it was just natural for us to sing I mean, I was singing as soon as I could talk pretty much probably before then. And, uh, my great aunt was my first art teacher for visual arts, um, and did a little bit of that as a kid. Um, and you know, I went, I studied music in school and all of that, but, um, it was really during my, uh, my cancer experience as a teenager that I dove more into, um, literary arts, you know, writing and also visual arts. Nice. What kind of cancer did you have? 
I have leukemia. So we're, we're blood cancer cousins. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that you had to go through that as a teenager too. Yeah. It's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting time to have cancer. Um, yeah, I had, I had, um, acute lymphoblastic leukemia and I had 130 weeks of chemo and have been in remission ever since so that was, wow. I, oh my gosh, let's see if I can do math in my head right now. So, so I was diagnosed, I was diagnosed in 2000. Um, so I consider myself a 21 year survivor, even though I didn't. Yeah. Finish, well, know, congratulations on that. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Leukemia is uh, a crazy one. Um, but I'm so glad to hear that you got through it. And I'm sorry to hear that you went through 130 weeks of chemo because that sounds like a nightmare. Well, yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't walking the park and it wasn't, you know, to be clear, like, um, I had some sort of chemo every day, but that was a combination of, um, oral chemos, um, interthecal chemos. So it injected into my spinal fluid, um, injected into my muscles into, you know, my veins. I mean, it's a blood cancer, so they have to put it wherever your blood is, which yeah. is all over. It's all right. over. <laughs> the whole thing. Yeah. The whole, all of all of it. Um, I mean, they've done. I mean, in 1970s, I mean, leukemia was um, a death sentence. You know, 100% mortality rate. And they, um, there was a group of doctors that was like, "We're not going to do this anymore. We got to figure this out." And so there was a nationwide movement, and they enrolled basically every patient that presented with leukemia in a study. And they just experimented on these dying children wow. <laughs> until they find found things that worked. And so now my type of cancer has like a 95% cure rate, cure, like not just remission, but like curate. So, I mean, that's um, a huge testament to the sacrifice of all those children that came before me and innovative healthcare leaders. So. Yeah. A thousand percent. That's amazing that it's such a great amount of a cure rate at this point. You know, it's really inspiring to hear. Yeah. How did you feel coming out of that in your, were you in your late teens at that point? Yeah, I finished treatment around 16 and I'm so grateful to my tutor, my high school tutor. Her name was Anita and her name is Anita. And she I wasn't well enough to go to classes. Like I had one or two classes on campus and I did independent study for the rest. And she just had this sense in my sophomore year that like, I wasn't going to put up with high school much longer. And so in California where I grew up, um, they have something called the chess the California high school proficiency examination. And, um, you can essentially get your diploma during your second semester of your sophomore year. So I took the test and passed it and had my diploma. And I finished treatment going into my junior year, um, going into my second sem- semester of my junior year. And I just crashed. I was deeply, deeply depressed and um, had to drop all my classes. I went to choir and I did the spring musical and that's about all I, accom- I went to swim team. That's all I accomplished that year. Um, you know, I was just, trying to survive, you know, because when your body's, when you're going through stress and trauma, you kind of just have to get through it. Um, And then once you get to a little bit safer place, you kind of start getting to the other side, then kind of all of the emotions that have piled up start Mm -hmm. to come out. And the realizations, yes, absolutely. Um, So yeah, but no one told me that was going to happen. So that was kind of frustrating. Yeah. Um, yeah, but then come to find out that's like super normal. And I'm like, well, that would be great to know. When I like, do this. Like six months ago. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> I know at that point I was just like, this is only me. Like I'm just going through this alone. But you know, you're not. Everyone no. goes through that. It is true. Yeah. And it's just part of the grieving process, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And there's like there seems to be like another pretty common experience for people is to kind of have another breakdown, like seven to 12 years after 
Mm. which was about 10 years for me. And so I had another like really lovely breakdown. Um, and just another level of the trauma that was coming to the surface that I didn't even know was there that I couldn't really process as a, as a teenager. Like, um, I didn't really have the sophistication necessarily to really dive into the depths of what was still in my subconscious. Mm -hmm. Um, and so found some really good, some really good therapy and got to work through all that stuff. Um, and it was during that time that I was really feeling called to the work that I do. Um, which, you know, I, I'm, I'm the founder and CEO of Hearts Need Art Creative Support for Patients and Caregivers. Yes. Um, And do you want me to tell the story now? Yeah, of course. So you got into it like after this second sort of realization of everything that you've gone through. Yeah, it was kind of going on concurrently. And my involvement on the oncology unit was kind of bringing up this trauma and was triggering it. Um, Stuff that I didn't know was still there. So I, I graduated with my degree in music and psychology. I moved to San Antonio, Texas with my husband and I started volunteering on an adult oncology unit. And I'd only ever been on a pediatric hospital Mm. period. I'd like never even been to an adult hospital. And I got to the unit and I was like, oh, this is bad. (laughs) (laughs) You know, at least in, in, in pediatrics, like there's, there's art and there's bright colors and there's people coming visiting the halls and there's activities and there's child life and Mm -hmm. you know there's there's an acknowledgement like that we need to surround children with supportive services to address the whole person not just the disease right and I didn't see that in oncology in the adult world at um, all yeah yeah it's and very bleak <laughs> it's very bleak and it's like we we create these environments where we send people to get well to like receive healing and the environment does not support that right so like what are we doing right. like there was a there was a, there was a study a while ago well two studies i'll reference um that there's been well, there's been several studies that have come out recently about how hazardous isolation is to our health, that it's more deadly than smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. It's more deadly than obesity and heart disease, that it's, um, we're wired for connection. And when we don't have it, we start to shrivel up and die. Essentially. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a study that was done on rats they took a group of rats and um injected them with cancer which you know thank you rats for your (laughs) sacrifice to (laughs) the advancement of research and science um and they were split into two groups and one group of rats were put in individual cages by themselves and the other group of rats was put into just a community of rats they all kind of lived together and then they measured the growth of the cancer over the course of time And the rats that were isolated, their cancers grew at a significantly higher rate than those that were in a social setting. And what do our hospitals look like? They look like little Mm -hmm. boxes. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Yeah. I totally believe it. I mean, sitting in an isolation room, I mean, mm-hmm. it's nice because you're like, oh, I get my own room, you know, whatever. But then after like a week, you're like, I'm so bored. TV uh-huh. is boring. <laughs> like <laughs> I want to do stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I saw this happening. I saw so many patients that weren't much older than I was when I finished treatment that were being treated here. And so I did the only thing I knew how to do. I just started singing for patients and I would bring, I I did, I did musical theater in kind of my first career. And so I'd bring castmates to come and, and sing on the unit and do little concerts. And, um, I would round with the, with the social workers and go and see patients that were, um, having a really hard time, whether newly diagnosed or had bad news or, um, just like you said, like bored and, and just lonely out of their minds. Mm -hmm. And the power of going into a room and, you know, saying, Hey, what kind of music do you like? And then reflecting that back and like singing it back to them. Um, it's powerful, the trans transformation that can happen. Um, and the thing I heard 
second most from patients after, oh my gosh, thank you so much, was, oh, we need more of this. Like, this is nice that you're here and all, but like, this is not enough. Um, and <laughs> do I was more. Thinking, oh, yeah. Do more, please. Yeah. So, I, you know, I was feeling the same challenge to do more, but then I was also struggling with um, um, my own trauma. And mm. so I would go to the hospital and I'd have panic attacks and I'd call my mom from the <laughs> from the garage and be like, I don't know if I could do it today. And she's yeah. like, we, we breathe together. We pray together. Um, and then yeah. I would go and do what I could. And some days that meant like not going, you know, when it, it sometimes it was too hard. Um, uh, and so during that time, that's when I found good therapy and was starting to deal with all that trauma. And then when we got through that, I really felt like, God saying like, okay, I've cleared, we've cleared this out and now you need to go back in. Mm. Um, and so that's what I did. And I started Heart Scene Art in 2016 to identify other artists and musicians in the community to um, engage these patients and uh, just connect with them really through the arts. That's really our main goal is just to connect with people and um, love on them and make sure they know that they're not alone and to help them remember that they're, they're still human and they're still a person. They're not just a disease. Yeah. I love that so much. I think that's so necessary. And especially in, uh, cancer patients and just people that are in the hospital for long amounts of time that, you know, are doing nothing and aren't really given that love and support in the ways in which pediatrics have been. You know, there's so many programs um, for pediatrics, Everyone wants rightfully to help so. The cute little bald kid. Right. I mean, they're adorable. Rightfully so. I get it. I get it. There's a lot of support there. Yeah. There's- we could spread the love out a little bit. <laughs> exactly. And especially because, I mean, I got sick when I was 22. So like the, the cutoff for pediatrics is 21. Yeah. So, I mean, what's really the difference there? I mean, I still like to do art, you know, I still like to no. like, do things like, at that age. <laughs> we like magically become different like beings when we turn 18 or 21 right. or, you know, or 22, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So hearts need art. I love that. And so do you guys go into hospital facilities still, or mm-hmm. is it outside of that? Yeah. So we, well, <laughs> the, during COVID, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, so before COVID, yes, all of our programs were in person. Um, and during COVID, so we were out of the hospital for 14 months. Uh, and so we, we restructured our whole program and we built a virtual platform where we could patient patients and caregivers could make appointments directly with our artists so we could work through zoom and we built a program to support um uh, healthcare workers called gratitude grams uh, where healthcare workers can enroll in the program and then they get um regular they get matched with one of our artists and then they get regular emails from that artist with a video, like a three to five minute video of a message of thanks, often from someone in the community um, combined with an inspiring song or a poem or a simple art activity just to help lift and kind of shift their perspective during um, all the high stress that they're going through right now. Um, So we did all that. We've worked with groups all over the country because of that, which has been really, really cool. Um, But now we're back in person and we're really excited to be back in person, but we're keeping some of our virtual elements. Um, So if you're actually, if you're a patient or caregiver listening, you can actually go to our website, heartseenart.org and click on the virtual arts tab. And you can, no matter where you are in the country, you can make an appointment and have these personalized sessions with an artist and there is the biggest that like the biggest objection I hear from people is oh but I'm not an artist oh I can't do that oh I can't whatever and it's like I love that I love it when people say that because I love watching people discover their creativity and at least using the art expressively it's not about becoming an amazing painter or musician or anything like some basic tools can help you really tap into um, the power of your creativity to express the deepest joys and sorrows of life. That's why humans have the arts and that's the role that the arts have played throughout human history 
And we should all have the tools to do that. It's not just, it doesn't just belong to the elite or to those privileged enough to have studied, you know, th- through school or whatever, mm-hmm. but we all have a right to our, our own voice, um, our own mark making, um, our own, you know, words, you know, however, our movement, <laughs> however it yeah. is that you most connect. Um, uh, it's, it's essential. And yeah. the data, the research is, showing that, that it really has an impact, a significant impact on our health and well-being. That's so important that people like are able to express themselves in ways, even if they're not good at it, you know, yeah. come do bad art and we'll have a great time. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Expectations are low here. Exactly. So, <laughs> to be fair, you're not giving them like these coloring books, these adult coloring books that everyone's getting, right? It's like actual like crafts and like things like that. Or like, what are the kinds of activities that you're um, providing for that? Sure. Art we, yeah. So we really, um, our focus is to really provide patient led experiences. So we have a diverse group of artists, musicians, writers that can, that offer a variety of different, um, backgrounds and skills and they can for visual arts because that's probably the most you know um, materials intensive uh, they can work with whatever you have so if that's a paper and a pen like they can do zentangle with you or little little relaxing drawings if you have watercolor okay great like we can show you some watercolor techniques um, it kind of it's kind of based on what you have we've had mm-hmm. we've had patients that have worked with us for like several months and have made like really incredible things like their skill has grown as we've worked with them and they've added new materials to their their supply stash um so what they started with is different than what they're they're doing now and then music it can just be um hey you're feeling down and you just want someone to connect with and play some of your favorite music you can just lay back and do that or if you want to um learn how to play ukulele or you have a guitar that you've been wanting to learn how to play like uh, several of our musicians can actually do lessons over over zoom as well um so it really depends on what you want to do and we have cross collaboration too like we have one patient who is writing a story about zombies right now and so she's doing the art with one of our visual artists and then she's doing the writing, the story writing with our, our writer in residence. Wow. Um, So they're doing this this collaboration on this project. It's pretty pretty fun. That is so cool. I love that you can do that. Like just explore in a different world for a little bit. That's such a nice feeling, especially just like, like we're saying, like being stuck there and like Mm -hmm. thinking about another world that you can be in instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. Oh, cool. And I love that. Um, they're patient led as well. Do you find that some patients get a little bit like stuck in points and is there a way to sort of like motivate them or give them like exercises in order to like get to a point where they feel they can find a creative spot or, cause I imagine some days there are people that are just like over it, you know, they don't <laughs> want to do anything, but like <laughs> they're still trying, you know? Sure. Yeah. We, 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 realize or we we know that um some people don't know what to ask for what they might want to do because they don't have a lot of experience they don't know what's possible so we have um we have different types of projects that we can offer to patients that are a little bit more structured so they can they can start to play with a technique like um mandala drawing or um like i mentioned zentangle or um Uh, even doing something as simple as using some watercolors to make a thank you card for your nurse Mm -hmm. and things that are tangible like that too. It doesn't have to be like, you know, visualize something and then we'll make it. Sometimes it is that, but usually it just starts with um, some simple structured projects that have been shown to help induce flow or relaxation Um, And those are good starting points for a lot of people when they're doing participatory sessions like a visual art session. But sometimes our visual art sessions in the hospital is just our our artists going in and um, doing a window painting for them. 
oh my gosh, the they're not that. feeling good. So um, they're just sitting in their bed and the artist can go on and be like, what would you like to see in your room? Like what's something that takes you out of here and would help beautify your space, something that you would like to see. And so they can pick an image and the artist will paint it for them on their window and it'll be there until they leave. And we have special permission from environmental services at the hospital. Where they, I was going to ask, like, <laughs> how do you get do this? <laughs> they're, they're so wonderful for like, you know, they're so sweet to allow that. And they take it down in between patients. Um, sometimes I'll leave it up if it's something kind of generic enough. Some of them are pretty specific, like sports team logos, right, <laughs> right. like that, that people are like really connect with. So we'll draw those for them. Um, so yeah, so we can meet them wherever they are in the energy level spectrum. Sometimes that's watching, you know, online. Sometimes that's watching our artist paint something because that's a really relaxing experience to watch the creative process too. And just it back and enjoy and it kind of again takes you out of the moment um, yeah going on and experience you. something different like, you know there's nothing really to experience when you're in there by yourself a lot yeah. so that's so great I love that because mm-hmm. you know those walls get pretty boring <laughs> so do you only work with um like cancer patients specifically, or is it just anyone that's in the hospital for an extended amount of time or anyone that contacts you? Like, how does that process work? Yeah. So, well, online, we have people from all different patient and caregiver backgrounds that we've worked with. We've worked with um, families that have a loved one with dementia and we've done projects with them as a family. They do it with their loved one. Um, We've worked with, um, groups with differently abled people. We've worked with um, people with MS. We are currently on a unit um, serving stroke and cardiac rehab patients. And that's a really cool, that's a really cool program we were were able to do. Uh, It tends to, it tends to work really well. It tends to be really needed in patients that are staying for long periods of time in a hospital. Uh, but even with meds, like with med surge where patients are coming in um, for surgeries and, and, and they're kind of in and out in a couple of days, the, there's research showing that listening to music, um, live music especially before going in for a procedure for surgery or anything like that, the need for um, uh, the the amount of anesthesia that they have to administer goes down and the amount of pain medicine they need after the procedure also goes down. Wow. Yeah. So that's amazing. um, I know it's, it's really cool how, how music and the arts, you know, affect our physiology because they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I love that. So it's just, it's not, is it only in the hospital or is it also you can just be at home and have like a caregiver with you at yeah. that point? Yeah. So the, our virtual sessions, people join us from home, people join us from the hospital. Um, it's, we can, wherever you are, <laughs> we yes. internet we access. Will be there. <laughs> yes. we'll be there. We've had people call, we've had people sign up for sessions on their lunch break and they just want to hear music while they're eating lunch <laughs> and we'll do that. Um, so, you know, we're, we're up for it. Um, so yeah. And the artists and the musicians, are they all volunteers? Like anyone can jump in and apply to be a volunteer. Is that how it works? Oh, that's a good question. So we, one of our other core missions is to create economic, meaningful economic opportunities for creative professionals. So providing, uh, you know, most, most artists, musicians are underemployed and often taken advantage of oh just do this event for free for exposure Mm -hmm. i'm like no i've worked for years and decades to hone this skill and yeah you think you know you should only pay me x for showing up for an hour Mm -hmm. but (laughs) i took it took a lot of years for me to, to be able to do that hour so we um we're really committed to paying professional level artists and musicians writers 
um, to do this work. We do have a couple of volunteers on our team um, that are professional, you know, are professionals in other capacities and they kind of, they kind of dip in and work with us occasionally. And they just don't, you know, they essentially just donate their, their stipend back to us. Um, but yeah, so we, we have a audition process for our musicians and we have an interview process for our artists or writers where we, we have to submit samples of their work. Uh, because while the creative process, like while doing the creative process is extremely beneficial for anyone, no matter what their skill level, um, listening to music that isn't like quite, that doesn't really create delight mm -hmm. actually creates stress. Mm, right. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's, and it's, and it's hard because we do get people who are, um, maybe more amateur level that just really want to, you know, love on people and give back. Um, and we'll sometimes get frustrated when we like have this, we have this kind of high standard for our, our artist team. Um, but it's, it's, we, it's part of evidence-based practice. We, mm -hmm. we gotta, we gotta bring delightful experiences to our patients and we have to all have a skill level um, skills at a level that um, um, allows us to facilitate those experiences. Yeah. But there are ways that people, so all that being said, <laughs> um, if you are in the San Antonio area and you are interested in, in that kind of, you're in that professional, you're professional creative and you want to learn more, you can go to our website and click on the get involved tab. There is a, there are applications on that page. Um, but even if you're not a professional creative or you're not in San Antonio, uh, you can still go to that same page and you can like write a note to a patient that's in the hospital or to a, or a healthcare worker. Um, and we include those notes in our program. We'll be like, hey, someone in the community gave us this note. They wanted to share this with you. And mm -hmm. that really is meaningful because a lot of times, again, with patients, when you're in the hospital for a long time, it's easy to feel forgotten. Mm -hmm. And to have a note from someone in the community, like we get the most, we get some of the most tears <laughs> from when we get to share those notes and we always need more of them. So that's actually kind of a big need. So if you want um, to do that, you can go on the get involved tab, um, or you can go directly to like the, um, the gratitude gram section of our website. If you want to send a note directly to a healthcare worker. So if you want to go to that line, that's where you can find that. That's amazing. Oh, I love that. And so, so needed. Do you have any specific goals that you have for the next steps of uh, Heart Need Art? Yeah, well, we're, we're kind of, honestly, we're kind of trying to find our footing after COVID and, you know, get our all of our programs back up, which takes time. Like, mm -hmm. we have to, uh, so that's kind of our first goal is to get these programs back up right before the pandemic. We were about to launch at a new hospital. So we're, we're now getting, finally getting to a place where we can start at that hospital here in a couple of weeks. Um, uh, and then at this, at that, after that, we're, so you want to hear my audacious my audacious vision. Yes. <laughs> um, I believe that every patient should have access to these services across the board. Like mm -hmm. when you go into a hospital, you should be assigned a doctor, a nurse, and an artist. I think that that becomes an integral part of our healthcare system. And it's already happening in, in different pockets around the country. Um, and so our one of our goals at Heart Scene Art, one of our missions is advocacy for the field as well. And so we have our, our own podcast called Arts for the Health of It, um, which is really cool if you want to check out and learn more about different programs in the field of arts and health. Um, there's such cool stuff happening all over the world. We talk to people all over the place. So Arts for the Health of It, you can see that on our website too. Um, uh, so really working to advance the field and advance the cause and help really get the um, the message out there uh, and doing whatever we can to play a part in that greater vision. So that doesn't necessarily mean I want Heart St. Art to be in every hospital around the country. You know, I think, I think it's more efficient to 
you know, activate local arts organizations around a particular hospital and offering the training that they need to successfully engage patients in the arts. You can't really like take someone off the street and put them in an oncology unit and with like a 70% mortality rate and then expect them to do okay. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. that, would be, that would be harmful for the yeah. artist and for the patients and every, no. Um, that would go. There's like a little bit of, there's like a little bit of training that yeah. is needed. Um, and we are, we're part of the national organization for arts and health. And, um, so we, um, we train all of our, all of our artists, uh, to abide by the guidelines of best practices that are put forth from the national organization. So that's amazing. Sounds like a lot of work that you've already laid the foundation of. And I think that this year, just like getting back into the hospitals and everything is just going to build from there. So I'm really excited to hear more about Uh, it in the future. Yeah, it's exciting. Where, where are you located? I'm in New York. You're in New York. Yeah. So many great programs in New York, like New York city, like where in New York? I'm, I'm a little bit upstate New York. So I was in Westchester for a while at at the hospital there. Um, but I go now to Sloan Kettering in the city. So we've worked with Sloan Kettering this last year. They have a, they have, you should look into it. They have a AYA adolescent and young adult, um, cancer support group. And we work with them once a month and we do a group art session with them with Sloan Kettering. <laughs> oh, cool. Yes, I definitely will. That sounds awesome. Yeah. You can connect with other young adults that have dealt with cancer. Nice. Okay, cool. Well, it was so lovely speaking with you, Con- Constanza. Constanza, yes. Constanza. Yes. See, that does sound more, um, I don't know. I went to uh, Russian in my head for a second. Oh. Constanza. There are versions of like there's in the there's like a German Constanza. So um Constanza was also was Mozart's wife's name. Um the German it's spelled spelled with an E at the end, but I got the Italian spelling of it. Um but so you're yeah. still in the musical field. So yeah. <laughs> it's like all the, the way parents there. did a good job <laughs> with the name thing. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Constanza, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and energy and sharing this with us. It's really cool. Thank you for having me on. And if yeah. anyone wants to check out what we're doing, you can go to heartscenart.org. Um, you can check out our podcast and sign up for sessions with our artists there. Cool. How freaking beautiful is this organization? Honestly, how beautiful. I couldn't stop saying it. Honestly, was so overwhelmed. I want for everyone to be aware of this, for everyone to write a note to a patient or a caregiver or a hospital staff, nurse. It's just so warming that there's something like this out there. And I wish that everyone would get involved. I want her goals to come true. I want every single patient that gets admitted into a hospital to have a art specialist why not our brains need stimulation in this way we need some love hearts need art check it out on their website linked in the show notes below make sure to follow their instagram page constanza is also linked in the show notes below be sure to follow her as well and stay sick folks keep it sick keep it moving and keep doing you sign up for virtual classes if you'd like i think that that's a really awesome option to also take advantage of and uh, reach out with anything that you need from me as always i am your host here with you until the end people thank you so much again love you take care